Martin M. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. Welcome to Profiles in Literature. I'm Jacqueline Schachter, a professor of children's literature at Temple University. Our guest today from New York City is the well-known author-illustrator Arnold Lobel. With us also is Carolyn Field, director of the Office on Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia, co-sponsor of our series of videotapes. Before we get to know our guest, we'll appreciate some examples of his artwork. The first illustration is from the 1972 Caldecott Honor Book, Hill Dillard's Night by Ryan, with drawings by Arnold Lobel. The other drawings are from books both written and illustrated by Arnold Lobel, and I hope you'll interrupt me to comment on medium used. The first one was a zoo for Mr. Muster, and now this a holiday for sequel. Mr. Muster. They were both done in pen and ink. A holiday for Mr. Muster. Right. This is Giant John. Right, also done in pen and ink. And we have the great blueness and, and other predicaments. These were full color paintings. And small pig. And this was a black line drawing with color separations, which we'll talk about later. Which of the titles did you enjoy working on the most? Uh, oh, that's a hard question. You always enjoy the book that you're going to be doing next. Oh. <laughs> For a while after finishing a book, you don't like it. And then when it gets old enough, you start liking it again. It acquires the charm of antiquity. For instance, one of the slides there was a zoo for Mr. Mustard, which was done in 1961. And uh, in 1962 and 63 and 64, I couldn't look at it because it seemed just terrible to me. Uh, but now that it's 10 years later, I look back on that, and it has a certain charm that I find sort of appealing. So wasn't that if we just live book? long enough, I'll get to enjoy all of my books again. I see. Arnold, wasn't that your first book? Yes. The Super Mr. Master? Well, it was my first book that I wrote and illustrated myself. I had done one other uh, that was written by somebody else. I was given the chance to do it, I think, as a completely unknown artist because it was 64 pages of fish drawings. It was a story of a salmon swimming upstream, and I don't think they dared give it to a well-known illustrator. So they found this young kid who came off the street, and they gave it to me. And of course, I took it, because I needed the money. And then the second one was uh, Super Mr. Muster. Did you uh, bring some samples of uh, slides with you? Yes, I did. Well, uh, I think we have yeah, oh, them Oh, yes. Here. Well, these are interesting because, again, this is a book that I am working on right now. And as I said before, the best books that that I think I'm doing are the ones that I'm working on right now, so I'm very interested and exciting, excited about talking about them. Um, this is a book about an owl who lives at home and is very sedentary, and I wanted to draw on the cover a picture of the owl sitting in his favorite armchair. So the first thing I did, well, now we missed that slide, was to draw the armchair without the owl in it. Then I began to start establishing the character as sitting in the owl chair, in the armchair. And I kept, these are different stages in that. He's, now he's got a bathrobe. As you notice, the book is getting smaller. The face of the owl is becoming a little more prominent. I work on tracing paper, and I just keep putting pieces of tracing paper over them again and again. My entire career rests on the invention of tracing paper. Without it, I couldn't possibly work. Uh, again, here is a continual development of the owl fitting into the chair. Just keep going. Now I'm beginning, to, as I said, it was a cover design, so I'm beginning to think of where the title is going to be. So I've made a little box around the owl, and I've put the title just very roughly in on top of him. Uh, and then here you see I've even gone a little farther. I've made more lines on the top and bottom to fit my name. And well, it'll be an I can read book, so there has to be another little banner for that. But I'm just beginning to think of the cover as terms of, in terms of a whole thing. And then I go back, and I, I, you can see now I've got those lines, and I've really decided exactly where they're going, and I put them in in ruled pencil. And then the owl drawing itself is really quite well along. Now he's got a little table alongside of him with a, well, there's a, that's pea soup, which figures into the story. I, but uh, uh, that has been added, and the sh some of the shading has been added to attempt to uh, get the solidity of this creature sitting in this armchair. Could I ask you about that uh, tracing uh, paper? In other words, you draw the picture of the chair, and, and then, then, then I draw, you use right. a constantly uh, new pieces right. of tracing you, paper over you, the chair. Right. You the can, chair is all set. 
Well, more or less. yes and no, more, more or, or less. less. The nice right. thing about tracing paper is you can take away on the next drawing what you don't like right. about the drawing you did before, and you can retain the things that you do like, and you just keep working and working until you like everything. Did you also bring, uh, I think he Yeah, there's just a few more. There's one, see, I decided the last one to make him extremely comfortable, I give him a footstool. Oh, I Which don't. wasn't present That's in any of the other sweet pictures. That's of you, Arnold. Yes, and then this, it doesn't really show, this is a sketch of the finished cover. I wonder if you could, can, well, you don't see the whole thing, unfortunately, but on the top it says Owl at Home, and then there, there's a border of flowers, and, and uh, um, again, this is just a sketch because this book has not been done, and I'll probably continue to work on this. And, probably make other changes anyway, but it's an attempt to show the development of how I think I from see. something very rudimentary and rough to the stage. The characterization. Do you not also have some other artwork yes. that you can share with us? Right. Let's These are, uh, <coughs> this is a, what you would call a potpourri of samples from work through the years. Um, well, this is the sketch, and this is the, this is another uh, play from Hilda Lid's Night, one of which we've already seen, but I think you can see here uh, how carefully I make my dummies. I think everybody tells me nobody makes as finished dummies as I do. I, don't, I think it's partly uh, insecurity. I feel I want to do it right away uh, and get it over with, and it's half the work. It's kind of laziness, really, I think. Uh, everybody thinks I'm crazy when they see my sketches, because apparently many artists don't work this carefully. And of course, the dummy is the first draft, right. is it not? And then this is the fi this is the finished plate. This is, yes. the, this is the plate in pen and ink. As you see, there isn't really that much difference. It's just a change of one is in pencil and one is in ink. But I've done all my work ahead of time, which is uh, something I always like to do. This is a plate from a book called uh, On the Day Peter Stuyvesant Sailed into Town. This is the black plate. Uh, there were, uh, it, their blue and yellow was la uh, later added on overlays, uh, again, which we'll go into in a little while. But this is uh, Peter Stuyvesant walking through the streets of New Amsterdam, bemoaning the fact that there's garbage all over the place. This is a pencil, this is a drawing done only in pencil from a book of Edward Lear's. I did not bring the book because the printer ruined it for me. And we can talk about that later, about how a printer can in one unglorious afternoon ruin two years of work, mm -hmm. which happened in this case. These drawings were among some of the best work I ever did, and then the book I'm hiding from the world because it was really a disaster. Uh, it was a great discouragement to me. But anyway, uh, this is a rhinoceros, it's an Edward Lear, uh, story. All kinds of crazy things happen. One of the problems in preparing uh, artwork, and of course, uh, this, is a, this is a full color book called The Ice Cream Cone Coot. It's, it's different kinds of burr. This, this is a bird made of ice cream cones, and uh, each burr, each, it's just different little poems about birds made, these are birds made of clocks. Uh, one of the problems in full color is that the black has to be separated from the color, and there are all kinds of ways you, ways you can do it. The reason the black has to be separate is because it becomes extremely expensive to do that mechanically, in other words, to do it uh, by a camera work in a studio. Uh, they can separate red and blue and yellow very easily, but the black has to be always done separately. So one of the ways I did it in this book was to draw the black drawing on this side of the paper, put it on a light table and put the color on this side. It's a way of working. I've done it a few times. And then the printer uh, switches the plates, uh, photographs them and, and, and flips them so that, they, so that they are, they'll match up with this drawing. And you get a very nice, this is the, and again, this is the finished result. There are all kinds of different techniques, all kinds of different ways. And perhaps later we could talk about the importance of, have, of an illustrator having a great many techniques at his disposal, because I think that is important. Uh, this is a book I'm working on right this minute. I just pulled it off the drawing table. It's a science book, and I do like to do science books occasionally. I think it's a pity that more illustrators don't, more good illustrators don't do science books, because few of them do. This is a book about dinosaurs uh, for very small children. This is obviously a stegosaurus. And these are the color overlays. This is red, and, and as you see, they're done in pencil. They're not done in color. This is green, also done in black pencil. The printer takes a picture of them, makes a plate, puts the plate on the press, and then matches mo the colors that I've already selected. He puts the color ink into the press, and I get charts like this. It's kind of complicated and hard to explain in an easy way, but I, I'll pick an orange and a green for my colors, 
This is, this is the orange here, and this is the green. And I, I can see what happens when the two of them mix together. You get all kinds of soft, interesting browns and greeny browns. And, and uh, what I have to do is kind of use my imagination and almost guess at what's going to happen when this green mixes with this red. Um, it's something you learn how to do through the years. Hopefully it comes out well. Sometimes it's a terrible shock. Sometimes it comes out very badly. You did something also, Arnold, inspired by this actual concrete object. Oh, yes, right. This is a book called The Clay Pot Boy, which uh, I'm very pleased with. I think the story is marvelous, and I can say that with all modesty since I didn't write the story. <laughs> uh, it's a kind of a Frankenstein story for small children. It's about a little old man and woman who build, who make a little clay pot boy, and the clay pot boy is very hungry, and they start feeding him, and he's absolutely gluttonous eats and eats and grows bigger and bigger until he eats the little old man and woman that made him. And then he goes out in the countryside and starts eating everything in sight. He gets larger and larger and larger. And I really wanted to make this creature look rather frightening. And all of my sketches were terrible. They, uh, they turned out looking like that little man that jumps out of the dough on television. I was very unhappy about it. And I just didn't, I had no way of, of uh, getting a, a, a hold on it. And, one day, while passing through my dining room, while I was working on this, I saw this pot, which we've had for years, sitting on the mantelpiece. And I said, my god, there's my clay pot boy. So with just a few changes, these are the sketches, part of the sketches, I evolved. Of course, this, now this clay pot is very charming and appealing, I think. But I made him sort of evil and mean. I took away his spout, and I gave him some very ugly blind eyes and a rather ugly mouth. And, uh, but he gets to be quite frightening and terrible, but he gets his comeuppance at the end of the story. But anyway, it's just interesting to show that you have to keep your eyes open and your mind open while you're working, particularly in the beginning of a book, for any kind of inspiration, any kind of something that can help you out. I want to speak now about two other prize-winning books of yours. Frog and Toad are Friends, Mr. Lobel's uh, book, won the 1972 Caldecott Honor Award, no, 1971 Caldecott Honor Award, and Frog and Toad Together was a 1973 Newbery honor book. Uh, we have some drawings inspired by these books that were done by public school pupils. I wonder if you could tell us what you think of some of these masterpieces, Mr. Lobel. They're competing with you. Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> you well I'm, I, I can only say I'm delighted. I get lots of drawings in the mail, by the way, from from Frog and Toad, and I get lots of stories. They add, they write their own chapters, oh. and um, it delights me because there. I don't think there's another art form where the creator is more separated from his audience than in children's books. There is really no way that a creator of children's books can get an opinion from his four to six year old audience. They are simply not going to communicate with him directly as an adult can come up to an adult novelist and sit down and talk with him about it. Or, uh, uh, you know, you can go and uh, be a composer and have your piece of music played in a concert hall and everybody will applaud and you know it's been appreciated. But uh, the only way you can tell how your books are coming across is by the letters and the pictures and the drawings that students, uh, that, that children do write. Uh, do, I'm always glad to see it. Uh, aren't there a lot of letters indicating the popularity of Frog and Toad? Right, most of the letters. There's a Frog and Toad fan club, you know, with cards. Oh, no, I didn't. I should have brought some, but they... I didn't. Uh, where did you get the idea for these lovable characters, and why did you pick on animals that are so much alike? Uh, I don't remember particularly having any close relationship with frogs and toads from my own childhood, which seems strange because everybody, I must have, but I don't remember. But it was during a trip to Vermont in the middle 60s when we rented a house. Uh, there were frogs and toads everywhere, and my own children would bring them in the house, and uh, I grew to love them. They're marvelous creatures. Uh, frogs make very bad pets because they won't eat in captivity. They just sit there looking very happy at the bottom of whatever you put them in. But toads make marvelous pets. You can take them home, and they'll you, they'll eat anything, and they'll they'll sit there. They hibernate for you. You can just keep them for years and years in an aquarium. If you oh, want. I didn't know that. Yes, and we did that several for several years. We kept toads. And the reason I picked these two characters, um, they're not. You say they're alike. They're really not alike. 
they are quite different. Uh, frog and toad lovers would take great exception oh, to that. See. And yet they are like, they're, they're good uh, uh, analogies for people because we, we're alike, but we are so, so different. There's, there's something about the fact that they are so close and yet so different that Why? I thought would be good for this kind of uh, situation. Why did you use limited color in these books? Uh, because I had to. The I Can Read books are, this is, this is an I Can Read book, which is a Harper series of early readers. They're all limited to three colors, black and two colors. I frankly like the limitation. I tend to like the books with fewer colors better than the full color books, generally, by me and by other artists. All right, when you say that they're an I can read book, does that mean you limit vocabulary? No, no. it means that I just, well, I have an I can read mind. I have no problem at all working in, in an I can, well, I think everybody does. I mean, one talks in an I can read way, you know, you use small words, occasionally you'll throw in one. I, I don't use a word list, and sometimes I will use a word that isn't an I can read word, but if I think it's exactly right and can't be replaced by a, by a simpler word, then I'll say, well, to heck with it, I'll use it anyway. The, the word avalanche appears in uh, Frog and Toe Together, and I thought, well, uh, if uh, it's a very good word for a child to know, because once he knows the word avalanche, it's a, it's a good word. I mean, an avalanche is great. So why not use it? Then I'll ask you, are there going to be more Frog and Toad books? Uh, I have no plans for any more. I have plans for books in the same kind of feeling, because I like the gentleness and, and you know, the simplicity of it. Uh, there's, a, you know, there's a tendency for an artist or a creator to start turning out a product. This, I think, particularly happens to American artists. They get a little successful, so they start grinding these things out. And I wouldn't want to do a Frog and Toad book that wasn't as good as the first two because that would cast a bad light on the first two. If I wake up tomorrow morning with five marvelous frog and toad stories in my mind, I, of course, they'll be I, more. I hope so. But I don't want to compromise the two. Right. And I, and I really don't want to make a, a kind of a product out of it, a kind of a, brec a breakfast food uh, thing out of it. It's your Aren't you surprised to uh, have one of these I Can Read books chosen as an honor book for a Newberry, yes, which I is was given for distinguished writing. Absolutely astonished. <laughs> I have well, no I idea how that too. came apart. I think apart. it's very <laughs> marvelous, and I do think it's the the uh, youngest book that's ever yes, been chosen as an honor book. I believe it has been. I don't one, well, one of Alice Dalgleish's, which was third or fourth grade, I believe, mm -hmm. but uh, not as young as this. Uh, you, you, uh, I hope it doesn't. Uh, there's. I consider myself a writer, a rather an illustrator who also writes. Right. And now that I've got this honor, I'm suddenly a writer with a capital W. You're going to have to write I books for the teenagers, you see. And well, you see already, people, my novel. editor is saying, well, now you've got to write a novel. You see, yes. Already I'm a writer with a capital W. And I hope it doesn't uh, make me self-conscious and constricted, because that would be rather dangerous for me. Because up until now, I felt very free about my writing because I've only used my writing as a kind of support for my pictures. Now that's all turned around in my mind. I'm in sort of in a state of confusion about it. I'd like to hear a little bit about your background, uh, early training. I know you went to Pratt Institute. Yes, it was all very depressing. Was it really? <laughs> was it, uh, were, were you uh, majoring then in illustration? Yes, I always want, to? well, I, I think uh, most art students think that they're going to be great painters, and I went through that period at last of a very brief uh -huh. time, fortunately. I did some rather good paintings, which I still have, though. But uh, immediately after that period was over, I knew that I wanted to be an illustrator. I didn't know necessarily children's books. Uh, I thought perhaps advertising, and I was terrible. Did you? Well, did you have a course in uh, advertising illustration? Yes, at France, right. So that you had right. some background. Some background. But did but they teach uh, illustration of children's books there? Not then? specifically, no, no. But I, I just happened to fall into it. Um, how did you fall into it? That's what I'd like Because I was starving, you. and it was the last thing that I could think of oh. to do. You mean uh, you, d you made the approaches? Uh, or yes, or all art students have to put their work in a portfolio and walk from place to place, and art studio to art studio, and publisher to... There is no other way unless your father happens to own the company of uh, being known. It's horribly humiliating and very difficult and usually fruitless. And uh, when I finally went, I, I, Harper's is one of the biggest and best publishers of children's books. And I left them for the last because I thought, well, there's no point in going there. I'll start with the smaller ones. And when they handed me this manuscript with the 64 pages of fish, um, <laughs> naturally, <laughs> I, I nearly fainted and I did it. I, uh, the editor said, can you draw a fish? And I said, of course, having never drawn a fish in my life. And I rushed home and drew fish frantically. 
and uh, got the book, got the job. But uh, th that's interesting. It's a problem. Um, I think the, medio the general mediocre level of children's books is partly because a young man with a family to support, and, and in those years I did already have a family to support, um, cannot make a living in children's books by having sure. one or two books right. out. It takes a long time to build up enough books. Uh, the, it just doesn't happen that uh, you, you write a children's book that becomes an overnight bestseller and you make uh, $100,000 on it. It, it's, it's, you know, you, it just doesn't, it doesn't exist. As, as perhaps it might in an adult book. Developing your backlist. Yes, and that is why I hate so many of the books that I did in the beginning, mm -hmm. because I would do anything that was given to me. You know, the publisher would call me up and say, we have this manuscript, and I'd say, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, because I needed the money, and I wanted to build up my backlist. And I had some very painful months, because I've learned through that that it is very bad not to uh, Illustra rather, it's very bad to illustrate a manuscript that you do not really like and have faith in. I've heard that from some others. Joe and Beth Crush have right. done this. And it's a long like process. It can last yeah. as long as a year. And if you're working mm -hmm. on a manuscript that you... Re if you don't like it to begin with, you will hate it when you're finished. And to get up in the morning and crawl to the drawing table, illustrating this awful thing that you can't stand anymore, it's really very painful. That is why uh, you have to be so careful in picking manuscripts that some other people have written. Of course, your own manuscripts, uh, you have no excuse for. You've got to like them. Well, now, with your own manuscripts, do you write the story first? or Yes, I always write, write the story first. I write first because, it. again, I'm, I don't consider myself a writer. I'm a rather insecure writer, and I like... The pictures for me are the dessert, mm -hmm. and I like mm -hmm. to get the spinach over with first, and mm -hmm. that's the story. Do you have to go to your editor with the story yet? Uh, if it's a Before picture you'd start illustrating If it's a picture not? book, I present them with a thing like this, which, uh, which is both a little the picture and the words. I type the words out because uh, it, it has to be a wedding of both, and I, I, don't, mm -hmm. I want them to see exactly what, what, what happens together. Are you saying you do the whole book before you go to your editor yes, then? Yes, with the pictures, oh, too. Oh, that's, that's yeah. very good. It, it's so just then a, it's accepted or not, you know right then and there. Yeah. He uh, says course. his dummy is very complete. Mm -hmm. um, a picture book is a wedding of the two. It's a marriage. And to bring in just a manuscript and say, well, I'll bring in the pictures in another three months. You know what my work looks mm -hmm. like. Uh, well, they do know what my work looks like, but they don't know what those particular drawings will look like with that particular manuscript. And that is what I want to get across. And also, it's important for me in the creation of a book to see how the pictures and the text going to work. I mean, after all, to a very great degree, I am my own editor. And even before I first brought it into my editor, I've done a great deal of editorial work on my own. And I can't really see what's happening in that book, how that book is working dramatically without both the words and the pictures. Here's a, a question I think you'll enjoy. Um, do you speak on whether or not you feel books should be primarily entertaining or realistic for children? Well, I think they can be both. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. I, I don't like the books that... Um, I consider... My, I can only speak for myself, and I consider myself an entertainer primarily, although I'm full of, fully aware that uh, the books are, of course, going to be... Ed everything educates a child. Uh, television educates... The most awful things can l bring some education to a child. But, uh, but it's rather like a te I feel myself just the opposite of a teacher. A teacher in a classroom is there to educate. Now, she can be amusing... But her primary purpose is to educate, and she's going to be amusing just to keep the attention of the class. M my purpose is to entertain, and peripherally, I can also educate. So that puts me in just the opposite. I think it's very bad if a, if a creator of children's books starts getting terribly pedagogical. I, I try to be. I try to, I, I'm also not comfortable unless I think I'm being funny. Unless yes. I think I'm being funny. You think, yes, that's um, a strong point. Mm -hmm. My way of reacting to children is through humor, and I think most people's way of react, most adults react to children through humor. And I've never heard this discussed. It's sort of, you know, you could go on about this. Why, why when you see a baby, the first thing you do is make funny faces. Yeah. And, and uh, funny noises. Yeah, uh, and then it just goes right on. You know, when you see a small child, you get down on your hands and knees and make a fool of yourself. Right. Um, well, you do that with some animals, too. Yes, you do. Cats. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why this is, but it is my way uh, of, of approaching children, of speaking to children through humor. I uh, noticed Giant John brought a bouquet of trees to his right. mother. 
Uh, you even get it into the illustrations where she's eating a shoe. Right. She's so hungry. And I had never seen, everybody accuses me of stealing that from the Gold Rush, the great chaplain, uh, where he does, he indeed does eat a shoe. And I had never seen the Gold Rush when I did that. Two great minds traveling the <laughs> yeah, same Yeah, right, channel. sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> does, do the funny parts come easily to you? Um, books do come easily to me when I'm working on them, yes. But I let them sit in my brain for years before I work on them. I, I, I truly believe the theory that they're working in my subconscious. Uh, and it's very odd. I'm, very, I'm, I'm rather like Mother Hubbard about books. If the cupboard is bare, I can, I can work well. I can create new books. If I know, for instance, right now I have two books of my own authorship that I'm going to be doing. I've already written them. I've worked on the pictures, and I'm going to now be doing the finished sketches. Now, that will take me another year. I, I'm willing to bet that I won't have any ideas for books until I'm finished with both of those, or almost finished. Tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about what they cons are concerned with. Well, one is the owl thing that we just right, saw over there, which the is an icon book, just looking at it. which is yeah. interesting. It relates to Frog and Toad in that uh, I tried using other characters like Frog and Toad in situations, and I found I was doing the same thing. I was getting the two people talking together and the isn't it wonderful mm -hmm. to be friends bit, and I kept thinking, well, I've done that, I've done that, and I don't want to do it anymore. So I decided I would write an I can read book about one character who lives alone, and during the entire book, and there are five chapters, he has no contact with any other he has contact with things, but he does not have contact with any other human or, or living being. Not, you know. Very difficult. I mean, he's just talking to himself. He talks to himself for 64 pages. He's quite psychotic. I <laughs> hope so. I hope it's really as funny as you think. <laughs> yes. Well, the, uh, it, I think it would be very nice. And the other book I'm working on is a giant project, which uh, is called The Man Who Took the Indoors Out, and it's in verse. And I like working in verse. Um, I've done three books in verse. And verse for me is like, I don't do crossword puzzles, but verse for me is like doing crossword puzzles. It's kind of that kind of satisfaction when it works out well. Um, and it's a rather elaborate story about, uh, about a man who simply decides to ask his furniture out for an airing. And uh, it's based on, uh, I, it's not based on Edward Lear, but it's inspired. I feel, I'm a great Edward Lear fan, and it has that kind of Victorian feeling about it. And it's a major, uh, graphic effort because it's got lots of furniture and lots of architecture and uh, I'll be starting it next month and I'm bracing myself. Well, speaking of having lots of furniture and lots of architecture, that sounds more like your wife's uh, type of illustration. Right. She, she does, does uh, the very beautiful decorative. Right. right. We ought to say that uh, Arnold Lobel is married to Anita Lobel, a very famous uh, author illustrator and you have two children an 18 year old and a 15 year old are they going to be following your footsteps uh the girl is an artist i don't think she has any interest in children's books she's interested in she may get to it though well, she you never may. know right. she is the 15 year old my son has is the only non-artist in the family which delights me because it'd be so depressing if all of us mm -hmm. were sitting there you know, it's nice to have one who is probably going to be an engineer or something of that nature uh, tell us something about your publisher, Harper. Well, it's not only, I work, I'm, I consider myself freelance, but I do the primary body of my work for Harper. Uh, well, who is your Harper. editor there, and is he or she very helpful to you? Uh, yes, discuss the editor's uh, I have role. my, my uh, editor, my principal editor, is a young lady named Barbara Borak, and she is extremely helpful. I keep hearing stories about artists who bring in work, and then the editor says, well, this isn't very good, and this has to be changed, and they get furious, and they storm out, and there's a great deal of brouhaha. And I can't understand that, because for me, if I've been working alone with a story idea, and I've been working on it for a long time, and I usually do work on them for a long time before I bring them in, I can't see them anymore. I'm completely blind to it. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's good. I don't know if it's bad. So I very much want, I show them to friends, and I get some idea, I show them to my wife, but of course she's, she's, she's prejudiced because mm -hmm. she's my wife. Uh, so I very much want an outside opinion. I want an editor to look at, look at my work and say, well, this is very good, uh, and this is not so good, and this is rotten, and I think you should really take this whole thing home and change it. And I, it may bother me, and it'll hurt me, and I may argue about it, but... Uh, I can't completely uh, eliminate what she says from my mind because I, I do get blind. I think everybody does to, to the work after a while. And what I usually do if a book is in trouble is uh, stick it in the closet for about six <coughs> months and yeah. I take it out again. And then I can see, I see it very freshly and I can, I can start all over again. I, I don't have much trouble 
that way changing things. If I try to change something immediately, it's terrible. And sometimes, well, Giant John, um, which is this book, uh, I think it was it was done in 1963. It was one of my early. Yes. Yeah. It was one of my ni earliest uh, picture books. Uh, I brought it in in its first. A, a, a draft in dummy form, and the editor says, this is awful, we can't take it, but why don't you work on it? So I brought it home and I said, I don't want to work on this, forget it. I was very discouraged. And what a good editor will do is she'll just nag you to the point where you'll go back. Every time I went in there, I was working on other books, and every time I went into the publisher, she said, well, where's Giant John? And I said, oh, I put it in the closet, I'm not working on it. Get that out. And so finally I did, and uh, many months had passed, and it took me no time at all to take the same, real and really the same ingredients that I had in the first draft, which was bad, and just move them around and manipulate them until I had something I liked and something the publisher liked. Thank you very much. It's rare to find an author-illustrator who has produced both a Caldeca two Caldecott on her books and a Newberry on her book, as you have, Arnold Lothel. It's been a pleasure having you as our guest.